my professor would write these big screeds on my uh, my short stories and things when I turn in. And he wrote on there one time, he says, you know, you should change your name to Brian Valencio Larson. <laughs> he said, and hey, why don't you call it? He said, he said, actually, actually, B.V. Larson does sound like a kind of a cool, mean pen name. That's what he actually said. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Victoria Gherkin, the head of acquisitions at Podium Audio. We are an audio first publisher that specializes in bringing the best sci-fi and fantasy stories into the audio realm. It is my true pleasure to be moderating a conversation today with two of our authors, both titans in science fiction, Craig Allenson and B.V. Larson. Uh, Craig Allenson is the New York Times bestselling author of The Expeditionary Force series, epic fantasy series uh, called Ascendant, and the novel Aces. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're here from sunny South Florida. Sunny South Florida, very yep. jealous. Uh, and uh, B.V. Larson. Brian is the USA Today bestselling author of over 50 books, including Undying Mercenary series, the Star Force series, Rebel Fleet series, and the recently launched Star Runner series. Hi, Brian. Hello, everybody. Hey. Uh, so both of our authors have new books hitting the market any minute. We are publishing Edge World, which is Undying Mercenaries book 14 on December 8th in audio. Uh, the book is already available. Um, and we are publishing Brushfire, uh, which is Expeditionary Force book 11, and that will hit the market on December 15th in all formats. So ebook, print, and audio on December 15th. Pre-order links will be in the comments. So that is the business end of things. Uh, let us get right, right to the conversation um, with you two fabulous authors today. You both had decades long professional careers before you uh, became published authors. So I'd love to discuss what your careers brought to your writing, um, whether just how you write, like physically every day, um, or what you write about. Um, Craig on Twitter, you said uh, nothing ever leaves Twitter, right? Vivi <laughs> Larson's massive success as an indie writer gave you confidence to self-publish your own books. Um, so Craig, maybe maybe you go first and tell us more about how you got started. Sure, I mean, really, I mean, Vivi Larson, Brian, the cool kids can call him Brian now. Um, That's fine. <laughs> the original gangster of indie sci-fi. I mean, I know Hugh Howey published the Will series back in like, 2011, 2010, something like that. Yeah, about but 2012, 2011, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then, I mean, BV has been doing it tremendous, 50 books, I mean, and he really gave me the confidence when I looked at the old Amazon author rankings, and I was saying, you know, the usual suspects up there, you know, John Scalzi, Peter F. Hamilton, et cetera, and I'm like, who's this Who's this guy, BV Larson? I'm like, oh, Star Force. I've read Star Force, which, by the way, you bastard, I'm going to call him out. <laughs> I was going to call my, uh, the, my my group in my book Star Force, and I'm like, yeah. he's already got that, so I have to call him <laughs> Force. It just rolls off the tongue, right? Um, it does, yeah. So, I mean, looking at you, I said, that's the way to do it. You know, write what you want, publish as many books as you want per year, unlike the trad pub model where, you know, it's one book a year if you're lucky. And right. there. And you really gave me the confidence that, oh my God, this this is possible. Well, I mean, you, I think you went into it with the, with the idea of really publishing. I went into it with the idea of, I've written books, I can't get them published. Uh, my wife is sick of me talking about it. So I published the damn things. And if I made enough money to buy back the cover art, I would have been happy. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be a career. I mean, my, my career was in finance. I worked for EDS and HP computers. And then I started writing, um, I started writing code for financial systems. You wrote computer textbooks. So yeah. one day my boss comes to me and says, look, you know, um, the contract requires us to do a front end system and a back end system. And we have the bandwidth to do one of the two. So that weekend I went to Barnes and Noble and I looked for uh, a programming book with the geekiest looking guys in the cover. So I figured like they know how and I started writing access code that, that Monday. And then, you know, I ported it over to XML. And, but that's how my career was. I went from being a finance geek to writing financial software code. And that gave me the boredom at work. 
<laughs> daydream about what I really want to do for a living and come up with all these wacky stories. So that's where it came from. So you that's, can thank that's you. pretty interesting. Yeah. Thank your well, business ahead. job for uh, for for inspiring you. The crushing, suffocating book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian, I wrote financial reports that nobody read. It was like a total waste of time. But. <laughs> and Brian, you're you're a teacher, right? Yeah. Well, I have a you know storied history too. I started off as an English major in college, but I. Figured I would never get a job except maybe teaching, you know, English, which I didn't want to do. My parents were teachers and I ended up teaching anyway, you know, but I didn't know it was going to end up like that. But um, I, uh, so I went into computer science and uh, I got my degrees in computer science and I ended up doing a lot of industrial automation systems. Um, so I actually worked in factories and did a lot of defense contracting too. But then um, over time, uh, I wanted to write. I was always writing still on the side and I wanted more time to write. So I got into teaching college and uh, um, by uh, some years ago, I managed to get a suite of like three, a series of three college textbooks, computer, computer science college textbooks published, but I could never get my fiction. Nobody would buy my fiction. I wrote like 10 novels and I couldn't get anybody to buy anything. So um, when 2010 rolled around and I was full time professor at that point, I um, I looked into uh, this whole thing about ebooks, and actually, I I was first I was freaked out by ebooks because I figured the same thing was going to happen to ebooks. What happened to music when everybody started just downloading, you know, and like a lot of people weren't making any money. It's like if they're already not paying hardly anything to authors, and then now we're just going to steal my book. And as an experiment, I I went on Google and I said, let's see how long it takes to get. Every just raw, cold, no, no, didn't know about a website or anything. How long does it take to get um, Stephen King's books on my hard drive? And it took me like seven minutes to get everything he'd ever written. And so I thought, oh man, I'm just, we're, this whole industry is doomed. That's what my feeling. I didn't know what Amazon was going to come along and create a way to get the books that was convenient enough that it would kind of revitalize things, right? So I, uh, I ended up looking around and looking at everything. And I found a guy named Conrath who had a blog mm -hmm. about um, self-publishing on Amazon. He was kind of a real uh, evangelical about it, you know? And, and uh, so I thought, well, what the hell, you know, if it's going down anyway, let me as well get this a try. And I thought if I could make myself a car payment or worth, that was my fantasy. If I could pay my car payment with the amount of money I made on science fiction. I would have called myself a winner, <laughs> you know? And so, I worked really hard all summer and it started working for me and I, I kind of took off and it got bigger. And then by 2014, I quit my uh, my job and burned my retirement and everything and, and you know, never looked back. So so it was successful, but um, I didn't know it was going to end like this. So I started cranking out books. I was excited. How many you know, books, Brian, did you have ready to go when you first started publishing? How many? Um, I had, I had at least, um, I had about 10, but... Um, some of them I've actually never put up because they weren't good enough. <laughs> and so most of them I've actually all written since then. So most of my stuff is new content. And, uh, and it kind of gives you the fire. It's like it's one thing if you're like just working, messing around in the summer, writing something that'll probably never sell. It's a little harder to get mo motivated, right? But once you've got it, like, hey, if I put this up, I'll get paid this month. It starts changing your whole attitude towards writing and gets you very focused. And it's like, uh, especially once you quit your day job, then you're really focused. So that helped put the pressure on me to uh, to perform uh, and, uh, you know, work hard at it. So I don't want to think people think it's not like easy. You're going to write one it's book and it's easy. like be a zillionaire. No. And uh, it, it generally does not work that way. Well, and that's, that it's work, like, right? It's yeah, work. It's, work. it's yeah, still yeah, work. Sure. You're, you're just, oh, yeah. you, you had careers and now you have a new career. Um, right. And, and being writers, but actually, you know, controlling your destiny, which must be right. great to be both of you. Um, yeah. So you've mentioned both of you. I know both of you have pen names um, and I'm interested in, not without giving too much away of your actual names, but I'm interested in the genesis of, of where your names came from. So Craig, do you want to tell, tell your pen name genesis story, which I kind of love a lot. Yeah, I didn't want to write under my own name. I don't remember why, um, but, I was trying to think of a pen name and I'm like, okay, I read somewhere that you want to be in the first half of the alphabet. Cause I was still thinking, you know, trad pub, you know, looking at the bookshelves, by the time people get to like, you know, um, O or something like that, 
they're gone. They don't look at the light <laughs> of the alphabet. So I thought, hey, I thought, wait a minute. My uh, name is Alan, A-L-A-N. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to Google it and see if there's an A-L-A Allenson. There's a town in Michigan called Allenson, but it's not anybody's name that I know of. And nobody uses Allenson. So first part of the alphabet, perfect. Nobody had any, I searched Google, nobody had gotten any uh, domain names with Allenson, snapped that right, up, right away and never looked back. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Father has all the bragging rights with his senior group right now. So. Yes, the son of <laughs> the son of Alan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and what about you, Brian? Well, my name, my story is a little bit similar. I mean, I uh, uh, trying to get the unique name uh, there. My name really is Brian Larson, right? But the middle part, the V, has a little more interesting backstory to it. So when I was in college and I took creative writing. My professor would write these big screeds on my uh, my short stories and things when I turn in. And he wrote on there one time, he says, you know, you should change your name to Brian Valencio Larson. <laughs> he said, and hey, why don't you call it? He said, he said, actually, actually, B.V. Larson does sound like a kind of a cool, mean pen name. That's what he actually said. And so I look back at that and I thought, ah. and so I didn't use it. But later on, when I got to Amazon, I decided to go and put my uh, books up and things. I did an Amazon search and there were five Brian Larson's. And one of them was even a computer science textbook publishing guy. <laughs> and so I thought, ah, oh, geez, you know, they're all gonna think I'm this guy, you know? So uh, I wanted a unique name. So I went back to the, the pen name that my, uh, my uh, irate uh, college professor <laughs> gave me many years ago. It's the ultimate revenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's like now I've become the thing you were criticizing. And, I, and it's great, it worked out great. <laughs> Um, so we've, we've touched a little bit on the fact that you both are techie guys. So you, you know, writing computer textbooks or doing coding, this is not the world that I inhabit. Um, mm -hmm. But you've created these worlds where, where tech is, you know, part of the story. Um, and you both have some terrifically imagined and realized alien tech in your, in your books. Um, how do you keep the balance of the science and the fiction in science fiction. Um, and Brian, I was I was actually just listening to book one, um, Steel World in your series, and I could totally imagine the um, 3D, I don't know what to call them, flash printers, I guess. Yeah, flash um, printers, and, yeah. <laughs> and Undying Mercenaries working. Can you, can you tell us the genesis of that idea? Yeah, you know, it's a combination thing because sometimes you have a, um, a desire, a literary desire you're trying to get across and then it, you know, you, then you kind of think, well, what have we got in science that would work with that, right? And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a book. If you look at uh, most military science fiction, like you look at something like Star Trek or something, you know, one of the problems with action-based fiction is that in real life, people would get shot and die, <laughs> you know? And if you've got these characters that you want to keep alive for like millions of words, and yet you get them a shot at all the time, after a while, it seems a little unreal that the stormtroopers can never hit anybody, right? And it, it, that kind of feeling, like, oh, I got shot in the arm again, you know, and the next scene, you kind of forgot about the fact that you got shot. That kind of problem. So what I did is I said, well, let's just have him get shot and let's have him die. And so I thought, well, you know, when a guy dies, you print out a new guy. And I partly came from um, some knowledge of the new 3D printers, which were kind of coming out about the same time I, I started that series. And also, um, I knew I've looked up, you can look it up now, it's kind of freaky. They are printing organs. You can print out like new flesh hearts with spraying out the cells and the cells knit together. And it's in this little, it's sort of really freaky, you know? So I thought, well, let's take an advanced data century. And so you're just printing out a whole new dude. And then I worked out about how the mind would work. So they have kind of embedded computers grown organically into their arms called tappers because they tap on them on their forearm. And then that is recording their minds uh, during time and recording their synapse connections. Our brains basically work. I was an artificial intelligence was my specialty uh, in the tech world and I was, was a computer science. So I, uh, I kind of knew how neural networks work and I built neural networks artificially and things like that. So I uh, decided to take that and say, well, okay, this is the neural network and it builds that back into the cells 
and now you've got the person again, except it's not really quite the same person. Sometimes there's a printing error and the guy comes out a little wrong, <laughs> which makes for good storylines. And that's kind of the, a lot of the core, the, the weirdness of the series, the science fiction element is the impact of disposable mm -hmm. people. And uh, it's like, it's kind of the old days, we used to repair our tools and things. Now you just go to you know Home Depot and buy a new shovel and they crank out a billion of them, you know, and they don't care and they don't cost them. So if that was a human life, it changes how everything functions. Right, you know, and that shovel the isn't, unit. the shovel isn't gonna last very long because it's not yeah. made of, you know, it's not the made material that it used from. to be, yeah. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the uh, genesis of it. Yeah, in Steel World, the aliens the, the aliens cheated because they were also printing copies, right? And they weren't supposed to do that. Oh, more than one. Yeah, the one thing is, yeah. one of the rules is, I didn't want to make it like an army of clones. And so I made yeah. a big deal out of it just being one um, copy. And then if you like, you break that law, they'll like incinerate your entire planet mm -hmm. because yeah. it would create a nightmare. Well, and then of course, by Clone World in my books, I explored the idea of somebody who makes a zillion copies of themselves of variations and makes his own society of himself, which yeah. is uh, one of the books. But yeah, but normally you can't, that, that is to control that factor, you know, is why don't you just make a lot of copies of the same guy, right? Well, you had to make a big penalty for that. <laughs> Otherwise, it would mess yeah. the book up, <laughs> yeah. mess the whole universe up. In Steel World, James notices that like one of the Tyrannosaurs that he killed comes back. Yes, and that was yes, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was when they were cheating. Yeah, there is cheating. Yeah, yeah. That's an aspect. <laughs> yeah, right. So, well, and and Craig, in in your books, well, you have lots of tech too. But um, one of the things that that strikes me about Skippy's access to uh, all the information all over the world, it feels to me like a cautionary tale about the internet and what Google is doing to us. Am yeah. I imagining that? No, I mean, like like Brian said, I mean, it took him seven minutes to download every book that Stephen King ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. This is yeah. a problem. You know, and I wrote it before the whole NSA um, data gathering, you know, campaign was announced and or, or revealed. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's if it's online somewhere and it's accessible, people can get to it. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we are being watched all the time. As my as my Instagram feed showed me yesterday, showing me something I literally looked at like two minutes before and suddenly there's an ad. Oh, it's so creepy. Yeah. It's our it's it's reality. Um so we actually put out um a, a request for fan questions um on on your Facebook pages and uh and we have some really awesome questions that I want to get to like right now. Cool. Um, so this is a fan question from Aaron Miller. He asks, what are the odds of a Joe Bishop, James McGill crossover? Craig, Brian? <laughs> well, I mean, James McGill gets laid a lot more than Joe Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and James McGill doesn't rely on a magical beer can to solve his problems for him. So, I mean, James McGill is smarter and more dedicated he dies all the time so how successful soldier is he um geez, i don't know I, I get a lot of people who want crossovers with this and that they want crossovers with undying mercenaries they want crossovers with bobaverse they want crossovers with commune uh i don't know i mean i'm too i'm so busy writing my own stuff right now i can't even think about it but uh, yeah, yeah. I just got a feeling that James McGill is so freaking devious. He would find a way to beat Joe Bishop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll throw my answer in too. Hey, Craig, you know, I mean, I just met Craig like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so it's a little early to, to, co to cohabitate for a novel. But uh, so no promises there. But yeah, I, you know, I can see why somebody would say that because we have a little similar feel to our characters in books. Mm -hmm. They're first person and there's a kind of, you know, there's this, this connection probably the reader that they feel uh, uh like they're not that many we're kind of a subgenre of a subgenre because mm -hmm. we're doing primarily um space marines which is kind of an offshoot of you know science fiction military yeah. and a smaller offshoot versus some of the like the more fleet oriented stuff so yeah but but so i can understand why somebody would think that they were in the same way but you know that's a conversation that we'd have to have in the future so right <laughs> There might be yeah. some time travel involved because I'm not totally sure your time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you can figure like, that out. 
It's like 2150 out. versus, you know, uh, yeah, like 2030 no. or something. Whenever my stories take place, which I'm not telling anybody. So. Ah. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. um, somewhat related to what we were just talking about there, um, a question from Carlos Pacheco and directed to Craig. Um, he says, I love the military banter you include in the Expo series. What is your process for researching this? Uh, God gave me two ears and one mouth, so I listened. <laughs> Um, like, I worked as a defense contractor my entire career, uh, worked around a lot of active duty military on the customer side, uh, veterans on, on our side. I listen, I mean, even going back to the Boy Scouts, most of the adult leaders were veterans. Um, and I, you know, I talk to people, I, I read military blogs. Um, I fortunately have some military people active duty and retired that I can ping about, hey, does this you know, ring true? And what does this slang mean? And in some cases I've had asked them to make up slang because at this point, the Mary Bend of Pirates would have their own slang, right? right. In, in years, so yeah. So I just, I listen a lot. And, and if you're wrong, I try to change it. That's right. yeah. <laughs> Brian, do you, you, I mean, yes, you, must have loads of military readers. You know, I, I know our the fan base for for Craig series. There are a lot of military veterans that yeah. we hear from, who you know get the authenticity and and love it. Yeah, you. I will say that I think Craig does a, a better job. I mean, I've read uh, you know uh, Columbus Day, and I was reading Columbus Day, and thinking, damn, this guy really does sound like the <laughs> the guys I know. And I have uh, my time's a little different because I'm. Your guys are like right on earth today in the US, which you have to put more of that in there. Whereas my books are more about a little bit in the future and a little bit like maybe a century in the future. So things are a little different, but um, still though, I try to get an accurate military voice. And I, my, my wife was uh, Air Force and my dad was Navy. And my my nephew is currently the sapper. He went to West Point and he's a, he's a sapper is like a, a, a ranger version of the engineer corps. Right, yeah. and so he's an officer in the engineer corps, and so and most of my best friends and my co-author, he was first using the uh, airborne, uh, and and then he was enlisted, and then he went out, got to college, and he came back and he worked his way up to major in the air force, and he just recently retired, and he co-authored about uh, I think eight of my books with me. Um, we've got a series together, so you know I've got a lot of military people around me. I also worked as a defense contractor, and I worked. Um, I've been. I worked at West Point. I worked in DARPA. I worked uh, a little more on the nerd side, though. You know, mm -hmm. not as much of the you know the straight grunt side. I mean, I, I worked at Los Alamos. I've worked on nuclear weapon systems. I've worked on um, things like uh, experimental plutonium refinery, stuff like that. Because I uh, I was an industrial um, engineer, essentially a computer science. I was a guy like putting computers in automating factories. So. Uh, a lot of my work was defense work. In addition to, I worked everywhere. I worked on oil platforms, and I worked on, you know, I worked on all kinds of weird stuff, um, uh, all kinds of different kinds of factories and plants and and uh, and stuff like that. So that gives me a little more of an industrial feel, and a, and I kind of know. So the people in my books are are the people I hear in my head. You know, I mean, so I could get a good feel because it's like, yeah, I, there's people who actually said that, you know, whatever it was. And it's, it's, so it's kind of a, uh, I, I guess what we're like as an author, people should realize we're, it's not so much like we're writing our own personal confessional of our life experience, mm -hmm. but it's more like, uh, you know, like you look at uh, um, Harry Potter was written by a woman, you know? So it's like not everybody has to necessarily live the thing to make an accurate kind of depiction of it. Because we're not trying to be the actor, but rather the writer. You know, it's it's a little different. It's like we have to right. we have to hear the people though. It's like if you're around them enough to hear them talk and know exactly how they talk and react, you can uh, you can really make it real. You know, and yeah. feel right. Like parts of parts of your lived experience are ins inspirational in your storytelling, but it doesn't mean it is the story. It's like you're not telling right. your autobiography when you're, you're writing no. these stories, but you're you know, a little bit. Yeah, I'm not actually shooting people with guns no, all day I coming out of a 3D <laughs> flesh printer. It's not actually no, my not real not life. That. No. But, you know, but, but you. Know. Uh, Ping said he was going through the front gate at Quantico Marine Corps Base and he just happened to have one of my audiobooks on. And the guard at the gate checking his ID says, Skippy, 
<laughs> Arrived. Arrived. Amazing. Um, so we have a question coming from the Fluffer Nutter podcast, which okay. I have to think is, is inspired by uh, your books, Craig. Um, yeah. Question to both of you. Um, are there any parts of your series you wish you'd written differently as you've penned later books in the series? Brian, you go first. Oh, you know, I'll tell you one thing. Oh, I'll tell you, well, first of all, the, the Undying Mercenary series, which is my biggest one now, right, is really kind of a correction, from my own point of view, to the first series, Star Force, which starts with the book Swarm and all. And that, the big change is, when I wrote those, I wrote them as kind of one long, endless story, you know, that is like a, a serial, like a, this guy's one million and a half word epilogue for 12 books. And so um, the trouble with that is you get into what is happening to Game of Thrones. If you guys, I'm not, not the series of movies and shows, but I mean the, um, the books. The books are impossible by the time he gets to book 10. He's got about 5,000 point of view characters and I think his secret plan, George R. R. Martin, is to quietly die before he finishes that series because he's never going to be able to finish that series. It's like that's his, he's going to keep writing them until he, you know, he's, he, he, he just kills them over because, because he's in the worst nightmare tangle, uh, you know. And so I got like with Swarm, if you write one storyline and you keep on adding more to it, and more to it, it's fun for like the first four or five, it's like, and then it's like, oh man, I got to pull this together. I'd originally planted planned a six books and I had it planned out and it ended up being nine plus, you know, and just to try to make it all add up. And after that, I got it to work and make a satisfying finish on that series. And I thought, okay, I'm never going to do that again. And so I made, um, the, you know, undying mercenaries is, is also, I wish I'd kind of kind of called it undying legions. It would have fit better because not as much mercenaries as the stories went on. But that, yeah, a big, not a big deal. Sometimes you don't know where a story storyline's going. But I made us more so a little more mission based, and so each story or novel is more you can pick up more in the middle and not have totally missed everything. And there is a bigger arc to the story as Earth gets more powerful and there's these alien forces and things. So it's kind of a two tiered plot line. You know, we're it, and not just a soap opera from day one. And if you didn't start on page one, you don't know what's going on, which is more how the first one I wrote was. So anyway, yeah. there's my story. Yeah, but, but my so my X Force series is like your Star Force series, where it's one big long story, and yeah. every book advances the plot towards it. Um, and, and I've I've held to the original idea for I haven't changed. I've had detours along the way, but it always comes back where I intended it. Um, where I would change is, I would introduce my characters, the Giraffa, um, earlier. They are these kind of beetles, and they're like gangsters, and they're obsessed with gambling. And for me, it was something I wanted to write, but I thought, eh, fans aren't gonna like this, it's me indulging myself. So I threw it into book three and a half, I think it was, uh, introduction. And fans love it. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. I wanted to write this. I didn't think you'd like it. So I would have been a lot earlier. Yeah. You should trust yourself. Trust your instincts. You know, my wife says that too. I really, really should. I think one of the reasons I've been successful, and Brian, I'm sure this is with you, I write the kind of books I want to read. I don't write what people, you know, I don't think, oh my God, what people out there want? No, I'm going to write the book I want. I'm very lucky with the book I like. Uh, also, a lot of people like it. I and mean, I'm very lucky in that, but I'm not going to just say, well, I'll write what's, what's popular. I'll write what I want to read. Yeah, not the soup du jour. Yeah. Right. Yep, sparkly vampires. Um, that's right. That's right. Hold on. Oh my God. I admire her so much. I mean, she took so much crap from the the vampire community of, you know, you broke the rules. Vampires are supposed to be You know, I mean, her book, you know, it's vampires aren't real anyway. Make right. It. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. The hell of it. Her book series, let her do what she wants. Right. Um, and and that's that was what she wanted to write. Yes. But, yes. Yeah. Like, oh, that violates all the previous vampire. Like you. 
<laughs> so I change change of course. I have another fan question from Matt Schmidt, um, and he asks, "What does the day to day life of Craig Allenson, author, look like? Are you in your guest bedroom?" Bent over a secondhand desk, or are you in a dedicated office? I'm like, this is describe my life right now.、Um, <laughs> well, my day is I get up, walk one of the dogs, I drink coffee, walk a dog, walk the dog to my wife, have breakfast, go running, whatever. But so at our summer home in Vermont, my wife has the office, and I literally write in what is like the upstairs hallway,、um, <laughs> or, or cubby hall. It's I got a desk there. And here in Florida, I have the smallest bedroom in the house. We're, we're, we're using for storage right now, and I've got this like plywood desk squeezed in the corner.、Um, and my wife has this big、yeah. office with yeah. She's so, the executive. She's like she has her executive time. Well, she does. She used to do all of our fulfillment, so you know, books and、um, patches and T-shirts and all that. So she needed office space. And I don't like I don't have a fabulous view or anything. When I'm writing, I like in Vermont we live next to this lake. I'm on the opposite side of the house. I'm looking overlooking the driveway. And, and when I write, I want to write. I don't want to say, "Oh, look at the you know, sailboat or jet ski or something." No, I want to write and then close the laptop and go get on the jet ski.、Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's not. And I basically. I have a writing schedule each week. How many words I got to hit, and if I haven't hit them by dinner time, then it is after dinner. I go back and finish it. I hit my word count. I mean, very few times I don't hit the word count that day, and it means that you know a day off that I'm playing with my wife. I got to get up early and do it, or I got to work late or something. But you got to hit that word count. It's like like you said, Victoria. It's a career. Yeah. And, When BB showed me the way. It is you got to get the books out. It's not one book a year. It is、uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Bobby Webber. So yeah, discipline. And Brian, are you are you surrounded there by editions of your books in many different languages, or what's behind you on your bookshelf? Oh, mostly as other people's books. I read、ah. back there. Yeah, <laughs> but.、Uh, Yeah, well, yeah. I tell you, I started off, and I I'm an engineering background, right? So I'm a coder. And so what that means is you go in there and you code, and if you're lucky, you you only code eight hours, you know. So it kind of gives you a discipline to a mental skill that normal、uh, people, you know, kind of walking around and sniffing the daisies and, and barely writing, don't have that kind of discipline. A lot of writers don't because they aren't they, they weren't trained that way in their、uh, mental outlook. So it, it suited me well when it came out. It didn't seem weird to me to have to write every day. So I I、uh, I kind of developed a system. Back when I was a coder,、um, of getting a lot of work out of myself in a short amount of time, and、uh, being successful without having to kill myself all day long, and it has to do with figuring out. And I, I studied a lot of this when I studied、uh, artificial intelligence and neurology and things like that. And it's like you know, we can only really be hot and creative so many hours a day if you want to keep doing it. And so what I figured was, if I could do about three or hours a day. Consecutively for years, I mean, you, you could do it. You could burn on yourself, you know, and work hours and hours,、um, work ten hours a day on a mental project for a couple of years. But after a while, you'll kind of burn out, and that happens to a lot of the content creators. You can see it all over the place because <laughs> they, they kill themselves and it, and it burns out. They never want to do it again. So、um, to prevent that part, I、um, I essentially work seven days a week, and normally I don't. I don't, even I work on Christmas, I work on my birthday, you know. But I only work maybe you know only type maybe three hours or so you know it's not like I'm just like typing buzzing around all day long right so by doing that by focusing in on this dedicated time slot on a very regular basis I'm able to be very productive、mm -hmm. and so I don't I don't I used to put word count limits myself now it's more of a getting to a certain point in the book which might take more and less words kind of a little different. After ten years, you might change how you, <laughs> how you think about some of it, too, Greg. It just—it's like you get a little.、Uh, you, you have to you flex a little bit as the years go by. Because those first years, I was a machine, man. I tell you, when I first started, I would get up and by eight a.m. I was at that computer and I did not leave until midnight. You know, I was like for like the first six months plus, and I was writing a book a month, and、uh, 
and that's how I launched. But and I was re-editing and making websites, and it used to be hard to actually put books. You used to have to go in and actually type HTML into your files yeah. to make them look right in Kindle. Okay. And so I was like rewriting my books in HTML and all kinds of junk like that way back, you know. But anyways, um, it's gotten easier, and the process is a lot more support and help now. And uh, my process is, is not as difficult, so I don't work. I work like three hours a day now. Uh, seven so, days a week, more like it on book writing. Yeah, I tend to do five days a week, and I have like heavy writing days and then easy days in between when I'm trying to think of what to write the next heavy day. Um, yeah. Somebody, I was going back and forth with another writer on Twitter, and she was talking about how she's a, uh, a pantster. You know, there's pantsters and plotsters. Yeah, and she does seat of her pants, and I'm like, no, I have the entire story arc <clears throat> book series planned out. And I think that's kind of my software background. I think of each book as a module mm -hmm. that uh, you <laughs> put. You, by the end of it, the plot is advanced to this point, and then you know. But it's within this overall architecture. Um, yeah, and that's that's how I think of it. Yeah. Do you guys that's, both? That's right. Yeah. Do you pause your notifications? Do you get like your emails and your messages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I log out of Facebook and Twitter. I'm on Twitter like, like at lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, don't block the internet because um, I'm a little more, I'm, I'm disciplined enough not to go on and look at, you know, cat videos or whatever. But yeah, I don't have, you know, Facebook on. Um, I block the email notifications, which you've noticed because I don't look at email right. until it's after dinner. Um, yeah. That's, yeah, that's Victoria, you probably you probably figured out that I'm not reading my email all day either. <laughs> that's good. Well, that, that makes me feel better because when well, I'm peppering you all with questions, at least I know I'm not interrupting the muse. But my wife, at your I'm, desk. Working, I'm working the noise canceling, the wife canceling headphones. Right oh. Yeah. <laughs> when she wants to talk to me, yeah. she texts. Right. <laughs> that's true too. Hey, I've got those noise canceling Bose specials right here too, so I hear you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, nice. Well, we're speaking of headphones. Um, I'm proud to be here as your audio publisher. Um, so yep. we've published X Force since the beginning with Columbus Day, and we're just taking over Undying Mercenaries with Edgeworld. Um, so let's talk about the audio editions of your series. Fans love them. Uh, Mark Boyette performs on Undying Mercenaries and RC Bray on Expeditionary Force. Um, can you both talk a bit about their performances? and what they've brought to your development of the characters and adventures um, of James McGill and Joe Bishop, respectively. Brian, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. You know, it's really been a big odyssey for me with Audible because I go back to when they weren't owned by Amazon yet and when they were like all independent and, and I met a lot of the people there in New York back at that point. So um, uh, Mark Boyette really did breathe some life into my my books in a whole new direction. So what I, I actually use that because let, let's just say you're writing a book and you're trying to rewrite it and you've just written 150,000 words and now you got to rewrite 150,000 words the third time, you know, and so it's a little bit hard to, you know, you actually will start, your mind will start skipping parts of it and you won't actually read it, you know. And so when I want to read over or re-remember what I did in a series, um, to make sure I'm sharp and I got the voices right and the characters right and the details right. I usually listen to the audiobooks, and that actually is a way of hearing them fresh. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's like a it's like I'm remembering things and I'm kind of seeing a different way. And it's kind of fun to hear the audiobook version. And I use that in the way to get myself ready for the next book in the series. Uh, and sometimes uh, further than that, um, I've actually had uh, I actually put cues in now a little bit for the. Uh, for the readers to give an idea of how their um, an accent should sound on a character, which I wouldn't really have done previously as much, right? And I also sometimes, um, I change myself if I hear how a guy voiced a character, I think that's kind of cool and I kind of follow that trend. So, you know, it, it, it does actually reflect uh, forward and backward. Yeah. My, I write for audio. I mean, I, I know a lot of successful authors write primarily for audio. It actually makes the book go faster uh, when, you're when you're reading it. What I do, mostly the difference between writing just for print and writing for audio is avoid dialogue tags. So if you're reading a 
it says blah 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 blah. Joe said blah blah blah. blah. Skipper said blah blah. Joe said, said hearing the said 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 it is audio poison, and there are still too many writers who do it. So I will do. Hello, Joe said. How are you doing this morning, Skippy? Ugh, today was a bad day. No dialogue tag. Back to Joe. Um, I, there, there are times when I will put a character's name in so that R.C. Bray will remember who's speaking that line. <laughs> because it's tough for him, and he records so many books. And mm -hmm. if I get, you know, a full page of dialogue where I know it's this character, it's two characters having a conversation. It's very difficult to have three conversations. Three people, because then you have to use the person's name on every line. But if it's one person back and forth, it's obvious. Person one, person two, person one, person two. But every once in a while, you have to put that in there because I want Bob to remember who's speaking that line. He's never been a mistake in there, but it's like it needs to be clear. Um, yeah. And working with Bob, I have avoided French characters because Bob hates doing French accents. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, doing writing for audio makes for better dialogue because you have to write the way people actually talk. It can't be this stilted formal language. It has to be like in a lot of my books, people say uh and um and they pause and a lot. That's like people actually talk, and mm -hmm. it's just across more naturally when someone's reading it to you. Yeah, it's it's definitely a more naturalistic, you know human way of of like understanding the characters i think by bringing in like what people would actually sound like like yes. you're stuttering me right now um mm -hmm. so actually this kyle reed a fan um had asked a question which you guys basically just um answered so i'm going to just quickly read the question then we're going to move <laughs> on to the next one but he had asked about uh, how your feelings on audiobooks have changed how you how well actually how authors approach readers um and then, you know, have you changed the way you write with the audiobook in mind? So, I mean, in terms of engaging with your fans, it sort of brings another person to the fan party, right? You've got your fans, then you've got Bob's fans, and you've got Mark's fans. So it, it's really an expansive way to think about your career. I mean, you're not just in a silo of the book. It's just sort of really great expanding universe of, of fans of the story in whatever format whether you're listening or reading. Yes. Hey, Victoria, one thing I yeah. wanted to add in there was, you know, I remember that uh, one character who's become a major character in my um, series, Undying Mercenaries, is this guy named Winslay. And he's kind of this slimy, weaselly um, adjunct, he's kind of this, a junior officer who's always trying to suck up to all the higher level officers. He's always trying to work his way up without doing any work, you know? And when I first wrote him, um, he was just kind of a throwaway guy in a chapter. But then when I heard the voice that, that Boyette put on him, I said, oh, I gotta bring this guy back. He sounds great. He really captured the guy. So he's been, and sometimes he's like the, a major villain. He's in all the books since and he's become a major character, pretty much because the audio book like changed my mind about that one character I have forgotten about. That's and so that, sometimes that that's happens. Awesome. That's like a feedback loop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That's awesome. Um, so Joshua Powell Morris wants to know, um, when writing sci-fi involving alien races with supreme technological advantages that make the protagonist humans ants to the proverbial boot, have you ever scrapped <laughs> stories or sequences just because you can't think of a satisfying way out? That's a long, that's a long question. No, so I, my book have all you know, impossible situations, right? I basically put the characters in an impossible situation and then figure out later how they're going to get out of it. Uh, so far, my brain has come up with a way to get out of it each time. I mean, before we started this call, I mentioned that I was in Cancun um, a couple of years ago, walking on the beach and dictating into my phone the plot of X-Force books uh, eight and nine. And I had the dilemma worked out, but I'm like, how the hell are they going to get out of this? And I just worked it out from there. I mean, I, I've never gotten written myself into a corner yet, although probably I will do it this week. So, yeah, um, no, <laughs> I don't have to really backtrack on things. So, and I do a lot of foreshadowing in the books. I mean, I'll foreshadow something like in book five that comes to fruition in book nine. 
Um, and fans, fans love that. Like, oh, I remember that part, you know, from book five or something. So, no, I've not, not had that happen yet, but I'm probably jinx me there. Let's <laughs> blame Joshua. Yeah. Don't blame okay. me. Blame Joshua. Brian? Joshua. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, it, it happened to me more earlier, especially when I was writing uh, Star Force and all, because I wasn't as experienced. But um, I would say that I'm kind of, I'm not as much of an outliner as this guy over here, as, as Craig. I'm, I'm kind of a half pantser, half outliner. And partly, I actually outline, and then things kind of warp off into their own. It's not like I planned to not you know, to not stick the outline. I actually mean to, but then somehow it didn't end up quite coming off like what I expected and some characters started taking over the scene, you know. Well, that thing, sort of thing happens to me. And so sometimes I do end up, and I, plus my books, I have a lot of impossible situations. But uh, that's, that's a big major uh, element of my books is to have impossible situations frequently, sometimes like every other chapter. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah you know. The, the tech can get you out of it. <laughs> that's right, yeah, the tech can get you out of it. just invent new tech. So, yeah, I kind of try to have things in the storyline that can help get me out of things. And later on in the book, what I always do, I learned that makes because it's very easy to blow that part of mm -hmm. the story and to break the listener or the reader out of the suspension of disbelief because you have an answer that's just not accepted. And so you can always have an answer, but if it's a stupid answer, people don't like your book, right? So a satisfactory answer is really important. So one rule of mine is that I always try to find the answer already in the story. So in other words, I don't introduce some new guy you never saw before who comes on and then waves a magic wand and fixes everything. I never do that. It has to be elements that were already there. So I literally will take and type out sometimes all the different things that are in the storyline. I get to the end of it and I start thinking, okay, what have I not really answered yet? What conflict is there that I never went to those characters back again? That kind of thing. And then I usually, it's easy enough. I put that together in my mind for a while. I think, oh, that's what happened. You know, even if I don't know quite what happened, I actually look at my own novel and I think that's what it has to be after a little bit of study. And uh, almost like you're playing detective and you're thinking, okay, somebody is the murderer. And you go through and you mentally figure out who the murderer was. And then it makes sense, even if you didn't, you know, it, 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 because it's already in the story, it, it always works, right? There's always a reason why that works if you focus on the, the story in the past. Sorry, you're getting uh, you're getting an appearance by my dog right now. Well, no. decided that is oh, mine was just barking too, so. <laughs> oh, it's that time. Mine are walking with big bones right now, so that you can go. Um, well, actually, yes, the, the dog is telling me that. It's time to, nearly time to wrap it up. Um, oh. But we're taping this uh, this Thanksgiving week. It's Thanksgiving on Thursday, and it's putting me in a reflective frame of mind. Um, what do What are you both thankful for this year? I'm thankful that I mean I, I know somebody who died from COVID, uh, but I'm thankful that my immediate family is safe and hopefully will stay safe. Um, and I'm thankful that people out there read my books. And I'm really thankful that I've had people say, look, and you've gotten your books partly have helped me get through this shit show 2020. And it's like, you know, what I do, what we do, Brian, actually matters. I mean, we give people a break in their lives where they look forward to going home or being in the car, commuting back and forth, listening to an audio book. Um, what we do actually matters. I mean, we're not frontline emergency workers, we're not doctors. We're not cranking out vaccines, but what we do actually matters to people. And I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do that. Well, uh, you, yeah, you, you stole my thunder on that one. I, that's true. It's not, I was thinking of, I'm thankful that we're able to provide some escapism and some fun in an otherwise Ooh. dismal day for some people. And, and uh, that's what I think I'm, I'm thankful for the most. And this year is like where it really counts the most. So, I mean, how many yeah. people are just watching, you know, binge watching Netflix or something? And it's like, well, you know, they, some of them are, are binge reading our, our stuff. And that's a, the same thing. It's like they're able to live in a different place at a different time for a while. And that really is a value. Yeah, I would love to binge watch Undying Mercenaries on Netflix. So it's, <laughs> it's going on that. So, yeah. Alex, same here. <laughs> Columbus Day comes to the big screen. Yeah. Hopefully. 
Yeah. Well, well, I am thankful to you both. And um, thanks for making time to have this conversation today. Um, it's great to be able to introduce you to each other, uh, do a little, uh, little literary matchmaking. Uh, and I am yeah. thankful for Podia. Oh, Especially the last you. year and a half, the relationship I have with Podia, and they are really a, not just a business partner, but we have a call every every other Monday, and it's my, my friends. Um, yeah, we're so well, your team, and Team you, Allenson, Team yeah, Allenson. Yeah, <laughs> Ryan, uh, you're gonna love. Doing this. I mean, it, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm here because of you, Craig. I've been <laughs> watching the yeah. audiobook rankings and thinking, who is this dude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's, he's getting more views than I am. What the hell is it? So I'm gonna find out. Well, he's published by Podium. I remember those guys. They talked to me years yeah. ago, and I said no. So then I came back around and uh, here I am. And it's, literally, it's because of you. I told him that the first time I, uh, I I talked to him. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're an author out there and you're looking to get to the next level of audio, um, I'd say contact Podium Audio and talk to them. I mean, it's they've been a fantastic partner. Thanks, okay. Craig. Thank yes. you. Thank you. It's fun to work with you. Well, I can't believe we've done so many books. And I think we've done... 15 of yours, no, 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 no. right? Is it 15? I don't have any books at all. 50 books. 15? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see, well, both of your new releases are for, for on the audio front are on pre-order on Audible. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, um, Brian's um, uh, book book, the book book of Edgeworld is on Amazon already. Um, and uh, Brushfire will be coming out in ebook, print and audio on December 15th. Uh, so thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thank you for your support of these authors and our audiobooks. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks.